Ready for fire! SpaceX's Starship Super Heavy Booster 9 is ready for aesthetic fire. The water flame diverter is tested. Is it good enough? NASA leaks new Falcon Heavy fairing, and Cygnus delivers cargo to the ISS for the last time. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Starship Update Welcome to another Starbase trip. As always, a lot has happened as the crews are getting ready for the first boost aesthetic fire with a brand new water deluge system. No need to worry though, I'm ready to guide you through all this news and show you the most fascinating things that happened in the past week with some juicy insights on top. We have no time to spare, let's go! As we typically do, let's start our journey at the launch site. This is where the final touches to the Orbital Launch Mount, or OLM, are being done by our diligent SpaceX workers. Do you recall the burn marks and the rust at the base of the mount? The remnants of the inaugural Starship launch? Did you know they are history now? Each of the six legs of the OLM has received a fresh coat of paint, restoring them to their original splendor. And what about that crater thing, the one everyone thought would halt work for years? With aerial pictures from our good friend Mauricio from RGV Aerial Photography, you'd be hard pressed to spot any sign of the previous concrete absence just three months ago. It's all gone. The outer layer of ordinary concrete and all that protective fondag has already hardened, fostering hope that it will successfully withstand the force of what's on the horizon. Interestingly, the doghouse, a component that once shielded the cryogenic piping leading to the launch deck, has made a triumphant return, albeit in a shorter form. The fortified base of the improved OLM with all that rebar and concrete has a better chance of surviving another Raptor blast. However, SpaceX isn't keen on risking additional months for repairs. Hence, they've introduced the water flame deflector, also referred to by some as the Super Soaker. Get it? Its purpose seems simple, but that's deceiving. It's in fact highly intricate. It must deflect the flame away from the base, preventing the intense heat from melting the plate itself. We first witnessed this system in operation on July 17th, when a massive water eruption occurred using only about a third of its maximum power. Yet that impact was astounding. Following some additional work on the high pressure system and tank refills, SpaceX was ready for another trial, this time at full throttle. Surprisingly, they announced that test on their Twitter, or X. Do we still call them tweets or are they called Xing now? The full pressure test was slated for Friday, July 28th. That day saw a crazy flurry of activity in preparation for this significant milestone. Subsequently, the chopsticks, or Mechazilla's arms, ascended the tower to prevent unnecessary damage during the test. That gives you a good idea of how much force that water has when it exits the plate. Once everything was set, the tanks were pressurized and then boom! Water began to shoot out from all the tiny openings in the plate. The test ran for approximately 20 seconds and it demonstrated the immense power of this inconspicuous system. Since SpaceX has recently become more transparent, they've shared some breathtaking footage from this event. Not only did we get a recording of the test in slow motion from the perspective of the launch deck, but Elon Musk also included an additional view from the tank farm. Upon close inspection of the first video, you'll notice that these are not simply straight holes projecting water upwards. And there's a very good reason for this. Many were drilled at an angle, and it's clear that each engine has its unique set of nozzles with 20 outer circles for the Raptor boost and a barely visible circle for the 10 normal Raptors. The fusion of angled and directed jets from a cone-like structure, a design expected to steer the flames away sideways to the OLM's base. Despite the test's short duration, the entire orbital site of the launch complex was thoroughly drenched. Thankfully, SpaceX seems to have a strategy for capturing some of that water. Aerial images reveal that what initially seemed like debris barriers have morphed into a retention pond, where some of the water was collected after the test. So are we done? Can SpaceX launch? Well, almost. With this massive achievement ticked off the list, all that's left is to finish the water system upgrades, which might happen sooner than anticipated. 
Just behind the tower, an extra three stacks of white vessels have been mounted. Currently, they lack manifolds to connect them to the rest of the system, but it shouldn't take longer than a few days for them to appear. Now there is one massive thing this whole system is still missing. Can you spot it? If your answer was the third water tank, then congratulations, you are right, for now at least. Recently, this tank, believed to be owned by SpaceX, was spotted in Kansas and is presently en route to Starbase. I anticipate its arrival within a week or two, followed by an immediate installation on the remaining pedestals. This extra tank should enable the water to flow for an extended duration, although I wouldn't expect an increase in pressure. After all, SpaceX has already confirmed the previous test operated at maximum power, it'll add extra runtime. Now that the system is partially operational, it's time for prototype testing. And with that, it's time to take a closer look at Booster 9. Excited? Lately, it was rolled out from the Mega Bay to be later positioned on the orbital launch mount, finally undergoing a high fill cryogenic test, epic images from YCAM operator Chief. Now, this prototype is patiently waiting for some Raptor action. Two spin prime tests are likely in the cards by this week's end. A nitrogen spin prime and an oxygen one to simulate the real deal even better. This test will spin up the Raptor turbo pumps without igniting any fuel. Just to see if all the piping was done correctly and to ensure that all engines operate within parameters. Although SpaceX typically stages these types of tests incrementally, ramping up the engine count with each one, this time around I suspect they'll aim for all 33 engines immediately to save time. Upon completion of spin prime testing, a static fire would be the next logical step. I sometimes have this stupid grin on my face just thinking about it. Once again, SpaceX might opt to ignite all 33 Raptors immediately or, at the very least, steer clear of single-digit engine tests. The next two weeks are going to be filled with excitement. I can't wait to see how the Raptor plumes will interact with all that water and how much steam will actually be produced. Of course, the super heavy booster would be of little value without a ship. Hence, we're switching our attention to the suborbital portion of Starbase. Ship 25, the next orbital starship, was placed on Pad B, one of SpaceX's two test stands over two months ago. Since then it underwent a spin prime test and a static fire, after which maintenance work was performed inside its tanks. The last time we took a closer look at Ship 25, we noticed that its engine shielding was scrapped. This pointed to the possibility that a new, improved shield was possibly in the works. And this was recently confirmed. I love it when our research works out. Unfortunately, this upgrade is yet to be installed. I'll keep you informed here and on tw uh, I mean X. Soon after, Ship 25 was being primed for movement. SPM transporters, accompanied by a ship transport stand, entered the launch site and a road closure was posted from July 31st to August 1st. However, in the end, no action took place, and it seemed that the relocation of this prototype was halted. There is a chance that as you're watching this, Ship 25 was already moved. If not, you might be curious as to the possible destination of this prototype, right? Perhaps the orbital launch site? Sorry, gotta bust that bubble. From what I've seen, that seems unlikely. Instead, I anticipate that Ship 25 will be transported to the Rocket Garden, where it will fill the void left by the now dismantled SN15. Remember that horrifying incident from last week? SpaceX probably intends to clear Pad B for more static fire tests. The potential next occupant of this test stand could well be Ship 26, which already possesses all six of its engines. Once moved, Ship 25 will await the readiness of Booster 9, during which time it could be fitted with the new shielding mentioned earlier. Since we're already at the build site, it seems only logical to take a brief look inside the high bay and investigate what's going on in there. Agreed? Let's take a look. While Ship 29 continues to undergo the final touches before its rollout for testing, yet another ship is being assembled at the same time. I am, of course, talking about Ship 30. On July 26, the forward dome of this prototype was moved into the high bay and just five days later it was joined with the rest of the construction. As of now, Ship 30 consists of a forward dome, a payload bay and a tiled nose cone. 
Looking in front of the base, we can see some intriguing activity. Do you remember how in the previous episode I mentioned that we could see the assembly of a hot staging test tank in the near future? Well, that time has arrived. On July 30th, both the S26.1 aft section and the former Booster 11 forward dome with a hot staging ring were rolled out. Each of the three components was significantly reinforced with an array of new and special V-shaped vertical and horizontal stringers, causing the hot staging ring to appear considerably more robust. Echo 3 from Twi- I mean X made some fantastic renders illustrating the new stringer shape, which will likely give better compression protection to the hot staging ring. Just what SpaceX needs to make it carry the ship safely up to separation. Thank you very much for the tag on X Echo 3. Intriguingly, a section of the forward dome was cut out and removed for reasons that remain a mystery. Any ideas? I'd really love to have an answer. Leave your ideas in the comments. Finally, on July 30th, the aft section and the ring assembly were transported to Massey's test site via SPMTs. Once there, our speculations were confirmed. All three segments won't be welded together. SpaceX, in a stroke of simple brilliance, chose an alternative route. The hot staging ring at its base has holes that align with the separation clamps at the top of the booster. Moreover, the top of this ring also houses separation clamps that secure the ship. If SpaceX decides to integrate this part with Booster 9, it would be a straightforward procedure. Just lift the ring like a ship and place it atop the booster. A simple solution that eliminates the time-consuming welding. This should answer a lot of when will SpaceX weld it on top of Booster 9 questions. They won't, it just sits on top like an adapter. Subsequently, the can crusher cap was placed on the top of the ship section. This signifies that the entire structure will be tethered to the crusher's base and tested to determine if the ring will hold up to the immense compression during flight. We might not even be looking at this ring's final form. It still lacks the necessary hardware to shield the booster from Raptor flames, which might suggest potential future revisions. Or the booster is strong enough to withstand all the torture without shielding. That's the hot question. What do you think? Is a super heavy booster strong enough to withstand hot staging and still be reusable? Or will it need a shield on top? Please let me know in the comments, I'll be reading as always. And while you're at it, make that like button burn. Subscribe, share this video with your family and friends and consider becoming a wise supporter. For as low as a dollar per month, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries from Chief, over 100 high quality photos every single day and countless other extras on top. No matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access, you decide what you want to give. The link to our Patreon page is in the description, thanks to thousands of supporters who create dream jobs on our team, you rock! Attention space explorers! Embark on an unparalleled online adventure with Surfshark VPN, the ultimate all-in-one solution for celestial browsing. Surfshark VPN not only operates in over 100 countries, but proudly holds the distinction of being the very first commercially available VPN with such extensive astronomical coverage. With Surfshark VPN's ability to bypass tracking cookies and IP tracing, you can confidently stick to your travel budget. Take charge and activate Surfshark VPN to unlock unbeatable savings on airfare and hotel rates. Longing to watch a movie unavailable in your country? Surfshark VPN grants you access to diverse content on streaming platforms by simply switching servers and refreshing the page, ready for your intergalactic movie marathon. Your online activities are for your eyes only, and Surfshark ensures it stays that way. Whether on your PC or smartphone, Surfshark VPN has you covered. It seamlessly initiates upon PC startup, effortlessly integrating into your daily browsing routine. Visit surfshark.deal slash Felix now to seize this incredible offer and enter promo code Felix for three months for free. Surfshark, surf with your own set of rules. Moving away from Starship, let's turn our attention to another impressive innovation by SpaceX, Mighty Falcon Heavy. The last time we discussed this engineering marvel, it was regrettably due to the delayed launch of the Jupiter 3 satellite. However, a day later, on July 28th, Falcon Heavy surged through the sky, carrying the heaviest geosynchronous spacecraft ever launched, Echo Star 24. 
Weighing in at an impressive 9,200 kilograms or 20,282 pounds, this payload toppled the record previously held by China's Xi'an 20. The latter, a communication technology test satellite, weighed in at a considerably lighter 7,600 kilograms or 16,755 pounds. This time there were no hiccups on the way with the spacecraft aiming for a geostationary orbit, but it wouldn't go there straight ahead. This most likely would require the entire Falcon Heavy alongside its boosters to be expandable. Instead, the satellite was placed in what's known as Geostationary Transfer Orbit, or GTO for short. It's an elliptical orbit that has a really high apogee but low perigee. Once the spacecraft itself reaches the desired apogee, so around 35,700 kilometers or 22,200 miles, it uses onboard propulsion to conduct a series of maneuvers. These engine burns raise the orbit's perigee, or as we call it, circularize the orbit, reaching a true GEO. This method saves money, as it's cheaper to add fuel to the satellite than expand the whole rocket. But it comes at a cost. Reaching the geostationary orbit this way takes more time, sometimes counted in months, and it reduces the satellite's operational life as it arrives in its orbit with less fuel. As anticipated, both boosters B-1064 and B-1065 executed a pinpoint return to the launch site, and we, the viewers, were graced with some awe-inspiring footage directly from SpaceX. That's not the only Falcon Heavy news I have for you today. Heavy is getting heavier. For several years, SpaceX has been talking about a larger payload fairing for Falcon Heavy to expand its capabilities even further. Currently, there is only one size available to all clients, standing at 13.2 meters or 43 feet tall, with a diameter of 5.2 meters or 17 feet. This sizing suffices to house almost every payload imaginable, but there are still a few edge cases demanding that extra bit of storage room. This is where SpaceX's more spacious ferrying could become very useful. In 2022, SpaceX was granted $316 million to develop an elongated Falcon Heavy fairing to accommodate payloads for the National Security Space Launch Phase 2 contract. This contract includes multiple launches between 2024 and 2027. Strangely enough, there was virtually no information about the development of this new fairing, with no images even affirming its existence, even though it was already announced. That changed on July 29th, when NASA's launch service program X account shared the first ever pictures of the expanded fairing. This enlarged fairing will not only be instrumental in sending classified US space lasers, but it will also play a pivotal role in protecting the modules of the Gateway Station, essentially the Moon's International Space Station. I'm much more interested in the space lasers, obviously. Surprisingly, the X-Ting, we really need a better name, was quickly taken down for undisclosed reasons, but we've got its contents anyway. From it, we learned that the fairing was tested in May at the Neil Armstrong Test Facility at NASA's Glenn Research Center, which houses the largest vacuum chamber in the world. The same chamber that tested the James Webb Space Telescope. While it's comforting to know that this mystical fairing does indeed exist, this only represents a fraction of the whole puzzle. To integrate it with Falcon Heavy, a dedicated vertical integration facility at LC-39A is required, a facility that, at present, doesn't exist. However, given SpaceX's track record for swift progress, I wouldn't be surprised if such a facility materializes from scratch within a few short months. What won't materialize in a few short months is another Antares rocket, as August 1st marked the end of the Antares 230 Plus series. This particular rocket, owned by Northrop Grumman, was able to exist thanks to the stunning teamwork of many different countries. The first stage, also known as the rocket's booster, was produced in Ukraine, with the two RD-181 engines used in this rocket being supplied by Russia. With the current geopolitical situation, it's easy to see why this cooperation won't go on for much longer. The Antares rocket family has always been laser-focused on a singular mission, delivering cargo to the International Space Station under the Commercial Resupply Services program. 
This commitment was demonstrated once more in the NG-19 mission, the first and sadly the final Antares launch of this year. Though in an ideal send-off, Antares leaves us on a high note. It successfully launched the Cygnus capsule packed to its full capacity with over 3,700 kilograms or 8,200 pounds of vital supplies for the ISS. This includes water, food, freeze-dried ice cream and groundbreaking scientific experiments. As the Antares 230 Plus retires, a sense of nostalgia creeps in. However, it's essential to note that this is not the end of the Antares legacy. Preparation is already underway on the next variant, the Antares 300. Notably, Firefly Aerospace has been given the responsibility of creating the new first stage. This revised booster will drop the two Russian RD-181s and replace them with seven Miranda engines a product of Firefly's ingenuity. Despite this change, the rocket will continue to be powered by the tried and tested Rocket Propellant 1 and liquid oxygen. This new first stage aims to generate a whopping 7200 kilonewtons of thrust, almost twice the thrust output of the Antares 200 series. Such an impressive increase promises a significant step up in its payload to orbit capacity. This collaboration seems promising, since both companies are based in the US. Therefore, they are immune to potential external sanctions that might otherwise disrupt the development of the rocket and its later service. However, one aspect that raises some concerns is Firefly's track record in rocket manufacturing. So far, their performance has been less than stellar. With two launches under their belt, the first ended in a failure, and the second was a partial failure with the deployed satellites placed in the wrong orbit. Consequently, they re-entered Earth's atmosphere just a week after they launched. What do you think? Is Firefly ready for this massive task? Can they do it? Or should Northrop Grumman rethink its strategy? Your opinion matters. Share your thoughts in the comments. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A link is in the description. And if you want to get even smarter about space and rockets, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Into re retention, re 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 retention point of activity. Yes. Yes. A plate. It exits the plate.